handshake to all the speakers and the coordinators that have put our circle together. Respects for the drums, the relatives, the winged, and the swimmers, the ones that four legged that are on the earth. Highest of the honor, healing our nations of united resistance. The war, the Harper put a war on our people. Everybody all together in unity. Great grandchildren to the great grandparents. Four times for all our nations. We need to find new ways of organizing together because, you know, when we are together, we are strong. And the other speakers that talked about in terms of history, you can look at our history of this country, what happens when people unite. You can look at what's happening around the world when people unite. Governments topple. Remember Tahrir Square, remember Taksim Square. The only real response to corruption and the abuse of power is mass, sustained, and fierce resistance. Cecilia Point, Delitz and Atla, Homasquim. I ask my brothers and sisters to stand with me today. Hi, Tepka, I raise my hands to all of you who stand with us in the fight against Harper, in the fight against colonization. Some days it's really hard and Personally, I'm really down because I feel like, uh, I'm sure all of you have felt this way, am I the only one in this struggle? How do these governments keep getting elected? Doesn't anybody care about our land and our water besides us? So I, I get a lot of strength from these gatherings when we're all together and our voices are united. And I look at people from all walks of life, from every religion, from every color, just like the, the four directions. So this morning, uh, I was asked to speak and I called my sister. I said, I don't know what to say. And she suggested that I, I read Chief Dan George's Lament for Confederation. Yeah. So I thought that was fitting and um, I want to ask you all to, uh, it's a very emotional speech. I don't want, if you could not have any tears. Um, I always just want to show our warrior faces because we're not crying, we're fighting to protect the land for our, our next generation. So going to read it, it'll speak for itself, and uh, I ask my, my brothers and sisters to drum with me while I, while I read it. How long have I known you, O oh Canada? A hundred years? Yes, a hundred years. And many, many seal annums more. And today, when you celebrate your hundred years, O Canada, I am sad for all the Indian people throughout the land. For I have known you when your forests were mine, when they gave me my meat and my clothing. I have known you in your streams and rivers, where your fish flashed and danced in the sun, where the waters said, come, come and eat of my abundance. I have known you in the freedom of your winds and my spirit like the winds once roamed your good lands. But in the long hundred years since the white man came, I have seen my freedom disappear, like the salmon going mysteriously out to sea. The white man's strange customs, which I could not understand, pressed down upon me until I could no longer breathe. When I fought to protect my land and my home, I was called a savage. When I neither understood nor welcomed this way of life, I was called lazy. When I tried to rule my people, I was stripped of my authority. My nation was ignored in your history textbooks. They were little more 
important in the history of Canada than the buffalo that ranged the plains. I was ridiculed in your plays and motion pictures and when I drank your fire water I got drunk, very, very drunk, and I forgot. Oh Canada, how can I celebrate with you this centenary, this hundred years? Shall I thank you for the reserves that are left to me of my beautiful forests? For the canned fish of my rivers, for the loss of my pride and authority, even among my own people. For the lack of my will to fight back, no, I must never forget what's past and gone. O oh God in heaven, give me back the courage of the olden chiefs. Let me wrestle with my surroundings. Let me again, as in the days of old, dominate my environment. Let me humbly accept this new culture and through it rise up and go on. O oh God, like the thunderbird of old, I shall rise again out of the sea. I shall grab the instruments of the white man's success, his education, his skills, and with these new tools, I shall build my race into the proudest segment of your society. Before I follow the great chiefs who have gone before us, O oh Canada, I shall see these things come to pass. I shall see our young braves and our chiefs sitting in the houses of law and government, ruling and being ruled by the knowledge and freedoms of our great land. So shall we shatter the barriers of our isolation. So shall the next hundred years be the greatest in the proud history of our tribes and nations. Osium. Thanks to uh, all the speakers here. Um, definitely hard to follow the words of Chief Dan George. And uh, I, uh, I reflect on another time we did that when Canada was turning 125 years and there were hundreds of us down by Canada Place that way. And then um, several years later, uh, the same kind of coalitions coming together uh, actually every year on this date to give the same kind of messages and um, well that year uh, I was there just uh, I wasn't speaking I was just coming along and uh, there was a little pushing and shoving amongst people with different views of what this day means um, and uh, <clears throat> you know I was trying to uh, just cool the temperature and I was arrested for that uh, particular privilege so they put me in the back of a you know, police paddy wagon and uh, all these people who I'd never met before lied down under the wheels of the paddy wagon. I, I was sitting inside the paddy wagon going, come on, what's going on here? Let Get me processed, I'll give you my fingerprints, give me my eight hours, I'll get out of jail, you know? I don't want to sit around a boiling hot paddy wagon. I didn't know there was people underneath it actually preventing them from, from doing that thing. And so when I think about Canada Day personally, uh, that's the kind of thing I, I think of. After I got out of jail, uh, later that night I went down to the pub where everybody was having a, a drink and uh, I met some of the folks who had put themselves under those wheels and uh, well I bought them around actually to be honest. <laughs> and, and solidarity is a lot uh, what, what this means to me and you think about the 146 years of this dominion and the history of it to me is extremely fraught. In, in fact some people are trying to rewrite the history as we speak. You know, it's part of the agenda of a number of governments and a number of jurisdictions. And I'm going to speak to you about the federal government a little bit, but when I think of the history of Canada, I think of a history of struggle. Uh, not a history written by the victors, but a history of written by the people confronting the power. And one of the things that uh, I'm coming to you today to speak about a little bit is uh, trade unions. I'm part of a trade union called the Canadian Association of Professional Employees. Now these aren't uh, blue collar uh, folks. We are, you know, sociologists, economists, uh, statisticians, librarians, archivists, like a, a, a association of policy wonks and nerds. And so you can imagine people who uh, advocate for science-based decision making have recently experienced a lot of layoffs. Last year my union got decimated by about 10% when um, the federal government started layoffs in Statistics Canada. That's the people who say what the crime rate is. If you're trying to pass a bill that makes for more prisons to put more people in jail with the idea that crime is getting worse, and you ask your own statisticians and, and they say, well, crime is actually going down. Well, there's two answers. You can make uh, informed policy choices or you can fire the people that gave you the information. 
So every day I work with people in, in the Canadian Federal Public Service who are fisheries biologists, uh, pipeline inspectors, food inspectors, uh, you know, people who are in a non-partisan, officially non-political position uh, trying to regulate a lot of the activity that happens in this country. And over the next 10 years, um, our government tells us there's going to be $600 billion of major natural resource projects developed mostly on or close by Aboriginal lands. So in this kind of environment, you want to make sure you have good science, you want to make sure you have good decision making. And more than that though, if you like the weekend, for example, the one we're experiencing right now, if you like not having to work 16 hours, if you like pay equity and maternity leave, it's the trade union movement who you have to thank for that. It's people like us, generation upon generation, who stood up and did something about terrible working conditions. And in 1947 or 45, in the middle of World War II, or at the end of World War II, the judges of Canada and the powers that be settled a strike at the Ford Motor Company by saying, okay, fair enough, uncle, you have the right to form unions, you have the right to form secure unions that have enough finances that they can stand up and they can actually meet the employer and fight for better working conditions, like the postal workers have done for maternity leave through a series of strikes way back a generation ago now. But right now, in jurisdictions across North America, there are serious efforts to undo that sort of thing, to take away the very existence of trade unions. Because right now, anybody who's under a collective agreement, anybody who gets the, the weekends or the time and a half if they have to work on a day like today, or health and safety, they pay union dues. If you get the benefits, you pay the dues. You don't expect your coworkers to do it, and it sounds like a small thing. But actually, it's very fundamental to the kind of struggles that you've been seeing over the last half century or more. The kind of struggles that not only involve the conditions under which workers work, but all the kinds of struggles that we've been involved in in this city since I've ever been here. You know, for 20 years from Gulf Wars to APEC to WTO and on, the trade unions have played an important part of that. And if they have the ground cut out from under them, the lifeblood of their own members' dues taken away, as some politicians are trying to do now, we will start to live in a very different society. Because although a lot of us aren't in trade unions, a lot of people aren't in unions of, of any kind, um, the trend cannot go further in the other direction. Uh, trade unions like mine have to find themselves a new way forward and really struggle intensely to preserve the kind of things that we've, we've won over the last half century. So when you see the next round of collective bargaining for federal public servants, and you hear on the news, oh, those people are lazy, uh, they've got uh, a pension, nobody has pensions anymore, that's not fair. Well, let's not have a race to the bottom where everybody's saying, if one worker makes $10 or 10 cents more than me, I'm gonna fight them. Let's have a push back to the top. So I'm saying, when you hear those things, when a government goes to beat up its own workers, what they do to their own workers, they will eventually do to other workers, and they will eventually do to you too. So when you hear these details about pensions and contracts and layoffs, that's gonna affect everybody in one way or another. Whether it's a less safe environment, whether it's just coming to a shop floor near you. So um, that's my message on Canada today. Let's not race to the bottom. Thanks. Is that right? 
right. We have a sacred right to life, is that right? We have a duty to serve, honor, and protect all life, is that right? We thank and appreciate the ones that brought this circle together, is that right? Is that a pipeline in your pocket? Or are you just happy to see me?